Welcome. Welcome, everybody. My name is Shadia Alvarez. I'm executive director of the Coretta Scott King Center here at Antioch College. Very proud to see you all here today as we both celebrate, reflect on, and take a moment to be together in community for this Transgender Day of Visibility. I first and foremost want you to know that you are in your house. You should feel good here, you should feel the spirit here, you should feel that you are in a place where you are not just welcome and that you not only belong, but where you're not looking for a seat at the table because you are the table. So let's just start, just rearrange it right now and make sure that we all know where we are. So first and foremost, I wanna thank the committee that put this together. Y'all not gonna believe this, but we didn't even have an actual meeting. We did this all on Google Docs. <laughs> Why? Because these amazing people are super busy. So Philip O'Rourke, president of Yellow Springs Pride. <laughs> Emily Seibel, executive director of Yellow Springs Home Inc. Steering Committee. <laughs> Co-founder of Yellow Springs Pride. Alexandra Scott, convener, <laughs> inclusive and resilient Yellow Springs Coalition, and also Yellow Springs Home Inc. Rosemary Blake, chair of the Community Council at Antioch College, amazing human being, and Alyssa Paulella, Yellow Springs Pride. We are fortunate to have uh, these folks guiding us, leading us, pushing us in this community. And it's sometimes simple to plan something when you're already feeling the vibe, you're already connected. And, and let's keep doing that, right? One thing I wanna say about the amazing Coretta Scott King, she was class of 51. Coretta believed in not just civil rights, but human rights. Coretta was a peace activist. Coretta was one of the first folks to sign legislation supporting LGBTQ rights in this nation. Coretta was not just Martin's wife. Coretta was a kick-ass organizer who deserves her props and her due. Right now, our job, Coretta, because you know we've been talking all day, is to figure out how to use this space to uplift the stories that need to be told to make sure that when we talk about visibility, we, we understand that it's fighting against a current of almost 360 plus pieces of legislation. It's fighting governors who don't have anything better to do, and it's fighting folks that have lost their ability to see humanity. And the last piece that I'll say as I, um, thank you for being here, is that we need to now broaden ourselves to think about not just our day-to-day -day and our individual ability to exist, but how do we start forming a quilt of action? How do we start picking threads from each of our lives, connecting them together so that we can be a part of a continuing movement in this country? That we will not be, whether we are trans or anything else under this banner, we will not be invisibilized. We will not be set aside. We will not be cast down. And we will not allow for other people to do that when we are a witness, because it's also about us being a witness and not a bystander. So I just ask that in the next couple of uh, moments that we're together, that we really carry that torch. And I know at some point we'll have a plan of action, but right now let's just be in community, enjoy each other's company, and do some good work. Thank you. Hello. Oh. I'm Emily Seibel. I'm the executive director of Yellow Springs Home Inc., co-founder of Yellow Springs Pride, 
and co-founder of the Inclusive and Resilient Yellow Springs Coalition. And Alexandra Scott is our convener. Um, <laughs> But uh, we are a coalition of organizations in Yellow Springs, and our mission is to identify and remove barriers to opportunity and success, supporting diverse populations for a more livable and inclusive community. And this event came out of that space. So we were just started talking across organizations. We talked to the Greater Dayton LGBT Center, the Antioch Queer Center, um, the Yellow Springs High School, GSA, <laughs> thank you, and then uh, also, of course, Yellow Springs Pride, and we realized we needed a space like this because it's not enough, it's not enough to just have events where the T is included. Um, I think we need to be intentional and explicit in our support and, our, and the visibility that we're bringing and the celebration and affirming and welcoming of transgender persons and transgender youth at a time when there is so much discrimination. And it feels like people are coming after transgender youth. They're a scapegoat for all kinds of other things. But the important thing is that you're seen, you're affirmed, you are loved, you are welcome, and this is your space. So we're hoping that you get to build from this. So this is not the, a once a year thing, this is an everyday thing. And part of that celebration and affirmation is the village of Yellow Springs taking legislative action. So it's my great honor to introduce Brian Hausch, the president of the Yellow Springs Village Council. And uh, we reached out a couple of weeks ago, to be honest, and said, we need to do something. And in like one day, everybody came together. We looked at what other cities were doing. We talked with the Transgender Law uh, Center. We looked at uh, sample resolutions. Judy Kintner, the clerk of courts, really went way above and beyond. Woo! <laughs> to draft this for you. And this is not the end. There will be ordinances, there will be laws, um, but this is a first step. So, Brian, thank you for being here, Honor the Honorable President. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. <laughs> so, um, I'm gonna read the resolution, and uh, you know, this is one of the things that is so amazing about living in a community like Yellow Springs, and it's why you know, I, I've been so excited to be an elected official uh, for nine and a half years, and uh, we'll see how long I keep going. But I think I also want to make sure we recognize, um, because I was there at that first meeting when we started Yellow Springs Pride, and the fact that our celebration is kind of the biggest one, or at least the most notable one in the state, and I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Hopefully everybody will be here uh, in June. Um, but also I've really appreciated that the Pride Committee has taken on this broader scope around you know, these kinds of events and these kind of, this kind of recognition. And um, it's certainly auspicious to be here at the Coretta Scott King Center um, for Transgen Transgender uh, Day of Visibility. Um, you know, something we've done for several years now and. Uh, it's always amazing to be here. So, um, so anyway, I'm honored to be able to read this resolution again. I can't underscore how much Judy Kidner did to bring this together. Um, and thanks, Emily, for uh, bringing it to our attention as well. So here we go. Um, so this is recognizing March 18th, 2023 as a day of transgender visibility and affirming the village of Yellow Springs as a safe, and welcoming community for transgender persons. Whereas the village of Yellow Springs identifies itself as a welcoming community of opportunity for people of any race, age, sexual orientation, gender identity, culture, income, ability, political affiliation, or religion, and whereas the lives of transgender and non-binary people have historically been devalued, discredited, and invalidated politically, legislatively, and in a myriad of settings across the United States. 
And whereas recent legislation targeting youth seeking gender affirming treatment and their parents and guardians has been enacted in four states and is currently under consideration in 15 states, including the state of Ohio. And whereas the state of Ohio currently bans transgender athletes from participation in girls sporting events, affirming a pattern of increasingly restrictive, invasive, and small-minded legislative actions in our home state. And whereas, while Village Yellow Springs has no ability to provide sanctuary to minor children who may be under attack from such legislation, no village entity is required to enforce such restrictive measures, and it is generally understood that non-enforcement of measures meant to limit and dismiss transgender and non-binary persons is a life-affirming and compassionate choice. Now, therefore, be it resolved by Council for the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, that Section 1, Council for the Village of Yellow Springs wholeheartedly supports all non-binary and transgender persons every day, but most enthusiastically on March 18th, which has been designated as Transgender Day of Visibility in the Village of Yellow Springs. Section 2, Council for the Village of Yellow Springs supports and encourages local and regional efforts to welcome transgender and non-binary persons and others who have been targeted on the basis of their gender identity and or gender expression. Section three, Council for the Village Yellow Springs is committed to the protection of law-abiding village residents and visitors from abuse, harassment, and harm, regardless of their gender identity or expression. And section four, no village department or employee shall deny equal access to village services based on gender identity or expression. Thanks, everyone. And we're going to be hanging this at the village offices, so it will be prominently displayed. I appreciate it. This is so exciting. My name is Phil O'Rourke, and I'm the president of Yellow Springs Pride, Inc. Brian said something that was so pivotal, and I'm so excited to be here because, you know, our festival is known. And what we're trying to do is make our voice when it comes to year-round resources in the village of Yellow Springs also be known. And with the Transgender Day of Visibility last year and this year, we're looking to partner with more. Somebody asked me, when we, um, when we were doing the mingling, you know, what can I do, what can we do? And you'll hear a few calls to action. And it's really gonna start with today. What is possible? And connection is possible. Visibility clearly is possible, but also action is possible. So I'm super excited to be here. And I am thrilled to continue with the support from the Yellow Springs um, government. And please welcome my friend, Mayor Pam. Thank you to Philip. Thank you to Shadia for holding this space for us. Thank you, Shadia. Thank you to Alex, to Emily, to the committee for making this evening possible. What I want to do now is share some thoughts from the office of the mayor here in Yellow Springs and read an official proclamation, just as Brian did. Whereas organizations and governing bodies across the world now celebrate International Transgender Day of Visibility as an annual day, theirs is March 31st, in which to celebrate the accomplishments and victories of transgender and gender non-conforming people while raising awareness of the work that still needs to be done, especially to save transgender lives. And whereas here and now, March 18th, 2023, in this space at the Coretta Scott King Center on the campus of Antioch College, the Village of Yellow Springs celebrates Transgender Day of Visibility. And whereas, at its March 7th meeting, 
the Yellow Springs Village Council unanimously passed Resolution 2023-13, the resolution that you just heard President Brian Hausch read. It was a beautiful document. And I heard it, I've listened to it several times, and I thank Judy Kintner as council clerk for creating such, such a wonderful piece of work. Well, at its March 7th meeting, the council passed the resolution as a day of transgender visibility today, and affirming that the village of Yellow Springs is a safe and welcoming community for transgender persons. I couldn't have added anything more to that resolution. So I wound my proclamation up here very quickly. Whereas, we let it be known that the diverse village of Yellow Springs is proud to stand in support of all LBGTQ plus individuals. And therefore, in line with our village values, the Office of the Mayor proclaims support, and I'm gonna modify this proclamation a touch. The Office of the Mayor proclaims support for Village Resolution 2023-13 and proudly declares the days of March 18th through the International Day of March 31st to be transgender days. So glad each and every one of you is here tonight. Thank you, Mayor Pam. You know, we're, um, I was on a panel and um, I was speaking, and you know, our testimony of how supportive our government is is not shared in a lot of communities. So I want you to know there is something very special about the support that we see we receive here in Yellow Springs and don't take it for granted. So next, we're gonna hear some stories. We're gonna hear lives. We're going to hear just what it means to be visible and some challenges for all of us to leave with. So next to uh, the podium, I would like to present Alyssa Paolella. Here we go, come on. Here we go. Hi, friends. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. My name is Alyssa Paolella, and I use they, them pronouns. I'm honored to tell you about our theme and introduce our first speaker. Visibility is being seen. Visibility is being counted. Try to get through this without crying. Visibility is being brave. Visibility is disruptive. <laughs> visibility is love. Tragically, for many, visibility is simply not an option. The Human Rights Campaign says at least 38 transgender people were fatally shot or otherwise killed because of their gender in 2022, of which more than 81% were people of color. We can only imagine the true number when we recognize the common practice of law enforcement and family, estranged family, misgendering those we've lost. Violence against trans people lives in homes and in communities, but it's being emboldened within state houses. Today, the ACLU is tracking over 350 anti-LGBTQ bills across the United States. Bills are being introduced and reintroduced in Columbus. I've seen the number of bills as high as 750. What impact does this have on our communities? The Trevor Project estimates that more than 1.8 million LGBTQ people between the ages of 13 and 24 consider suicide every year. Every one of them has a story, but visibility isn't always an option. And today we're showing up for them. Victor Madrigal Borlos is a Costa Rican lawyer and currently serves as the UN independent expert on protection against violence and discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. I'm going to share a few quotes from Mr. Madrigal Borlos. Despite five decades of progress, equality is not within reach and often not even within sight for all persons impacted 
by violence and discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity in the United States. He said, I am deeply alarmed by a widespread, profoundly negative riptide created by deliberate actions to roll back the human rights of LGBT people at the state level, such as deeply discriminatory measures seeking to rebuild stigma against lesbian and gay persons, limiting comprehensive sexual and gender education for all, and denying access to gender affirming treatment, sports, and single sex facilities for trans and gender diverse persons. And finally, he said, the evidence shows that without exception, these actions rely on prejudiced and stigmatizing views of LGBT persons, in particular transgender children and youth, and seek to leverage their lives as props for political profit. Civil liberties are at risk in this country, including reproductive rights, voting rights, LGBTQ rights, educational freedom, and freedom of expression. We invite our friends to join us in becoming disruptors for justice. It all starts in community. Next, it's my privilege to introduce Stevie Keck. Stevie is a non-binary trans man living in Southern Michigan. Stevie grew up in Fremont, Ohio and returned to his hometown to co-found Fremont, Ohio Pride. This nonprofit organization serves the LGBTQAI community, including hosting the city's first Pride Festival in 2021. Stevie talks with lawmakers and politicians about issues impacting our community on the local and national levels, and continues his activism as a drag queen king after the sun goes down as Stevie Phoenix. He has spoken at the last two years at Fremont's Trans Day of Remembrance Vigil and is excited to share the importance of visibility with us all. Please join me in welcoming Stevie to Yellow Springs. Thank you all so much for welcoming me here today. Um, you're absolutely correct, what you have here is special. I, uh, most of my work is um, centralized in Southern Michigan and Northwest Ohio, so it's not like I have the hugest broad uh, to compare to, but this is not <laughs> this way everywhere. There are certain places where I'm still fighting to just let them let kids go to the bathroom wherever they want to go to the bathroom. So um, thank you to the mayor and to the city council represented here today. Uh, that ordinance is a huge deal. Um, and I feel so just lucky and, and privileged to be able to be here in this amazingly progressive city with you all today. So just thank you all to Yellow Springs Pride and just everyone here for the warm welcome. Um, it's been lovely. Uh, my name is Stevie Phoenix. Well, Stevie Keck, sorry, identity crisis. You can tell that I'm trans because I wrote the drag to trans pipeline. That's how you can tell our first names are the same, whether we're in drag or not, because we started as a character and then we were like, oh wait, hold on, <laughs> this feels real good. Uh, so my real name is Stevie Keck. Uh, as Alyssa explained, I did how uh, I founded Fremont Pride. Um, and the way that that came about was um, I had reached out to some bars in my hometown um, and decided, you know what, I knew what it was like to grow up queer there, let's do some drag shows, let's just do something really simple to bring some awareness and some visibility. And the attendance at those was overwhelming. We started this in the time where there were capacity limitations because of the COVID-19 pandemic and we were put in a situation almost every single night where we had to turn people away at the door. So at that point, I decided to flippantly make a post on Facebook that said, hey, Fremont, if y'all like this so much, how do you feel about your own Pride Festival? And then before I knew it, my words snowballed into a nonprofit organization. But that is OK. I guess that's me in a nutshell. Um, I also do drag. Uh, my drag persona is Stevie Phoenix. I really enjoy portraying a very androgynous style and a very glamorous style of masculinity because manhood is not just one thing. Manhood can be very feminine. Manhood can be very glamorous. Manhood can be beautiful. It can be silly. Um, 
So I, was, I had the opportunity to speak with Dee a little bit before, and we were talking about when we knew we were trans. And um, you know so early, you know, humans in general actually have, including cisgender people, have a very good idea of their own gender identity by the time we're three and four years old. And Dee threw her fingers up at me and she said three, and I threw mine up and I said four. I remember being little and just loving being misgendered by strangers. I would constantly dress in a way, my parents wouldn't let me shop, in the, my parents wouldn't shop in the boys section for me, but I would wear the clothes that were the least girly, and I would always have my hair cut short. If they refused to take me to get my hair cut short, I would cut it for them, so then they would have to take me to make sure that it looked nice, and that I didn't embarrass them even further. But I loved it when people would call me a little boy. I would even insist that as a young age. And um, I got deemed the label that is the you know, right of many trans masculine individuals, and I was called a tomboy. Um, but I loved that label because that label made sense to me. That's just what people called me. I didn't realize it had some other weird convoluted meaning. I heard the word Tom and I heard the word boy. So I heard a word that wasn't boy and then I heard a word that was boy and I was like, that's me because I'm not a boy but I'm also a boy. That makes perfect sense to me. And it wasn't until I was in the first grade and I still remember this. My teacher's name was Mrs. Rexrote and she decided to divide the class up. All right, everybody, boys on one side, girls on the other. And I froze. I didn't know what to do. Uh, I just sat there at my desk, and she comes over, and she just kind of kneels down, you sweetie, what's wrong? And I was like, I don't know which side of the room to go on. You said boys on one side, girls on the other. I'm a tomboy, so I don't have anywhere to go. I mean, I guess I should probably go over to the boy's side because I'm kind of a boy, right? So I'll just go over there. Sorry, don't mind me. And she was like, oh, sweetie, I'm, I'm so sorry. That, that doesn't mean that. That just means that you're a girl who kind of likes boyish things. And that was the first time that anybody that I can remember had ever really stated that in that way to me. And I think that's when the glass really started to crack, if that makes sense. That was the first indication that I had that, oh, something's different. This isn't normal. Something's wrong. Because that's how it was phrased to me. Something's wrong. You're confused. This isn't what it is. And before you know it, you begin to forget those parts about yourself. And you grow up, and I went through puberty, and you know, I, I lived my life as a young girl. I lived my life as a woman for so long because you are told by the caretakers, by the people who are, you know, love you the most or who are supposed to love you the most in your life, this is wrong, this is bad, here's what you're supposed to do. You believe that and you gaslight yourself and then you begin to forget these experiences even ever happened to begin with. I'm still discovering things about myself. I'll have conversations with people and I'll be like, oh my God, you just unlocked a memory for me as a child. Like that, you know, um, like, you know, uh, uh, my obsession with Joan of Arc, and Mulan, I mean, come on. When, when Amanda Bynes did the, what, what was that movie? Uh, be a, she, what was it? She's a man or she's the man or something like that. I remember fantasizing because I'm in the entertainment industry. I did plays and I was like, that's the perfect role for me. Bro, I would grow my leg hair out for that. I would go all in. <laughs> but I'm cis, right? And as I grew up, um, I also grew up very, very religious. I was indoctrinated into evangelicalism as a young child. And being in that will also frame things in a way that, okay, this is, this is bad. <laughs> I would find myself Sunday after Sunday being at the altar for, you know, something unspoken, but I knew what it was in my heart. I was just crying, like, why? Why am I wrong? Why am I bad? Why, why did you do this to me? Why can't you just take it away? Because everyone around me says that this is wrong and this is bad, but I can't help it. And I don't think I'm wrong or bad, so can you please just, just take it? A funny thing happens in evangelical churches, probably churches in general, but the circle of religion that I grew up in, they tend to, as the kids say, ship people. I'm 35. Sorry. I also dab just to like piss my kids off. I'll be like, eh, no. just out of a room like that. They'll be like, ready? No, it's so embarrassing. The dab's dead. 
Um, but uh, yeah, they'll, they'll push people together. They'll see people. They, you know, and I don't even know if it's a conscious thing as much as it's a subconscious thing, but they'll see this person. This person has something missing inside of them, and that makes them so willing and so ready to just be helpful and to just find love and find belonging. All right, we got you. Here's another one over here, just like that. And they're both talented, and they're both good with people. Well, we gotta do some work here. I remember being 16 years old, and we're having like this, uh, I was on the praise and worship team and we were rehearsing, and the person who is now my husband, by the way, who was 20 at the time, so let's think about that for a minute, my youth pastor turned and said to me, my youth pastor at 16 years old said, you have my permission to marry him. So I left. <laughs> and I attended college at Bowling Green. And um, that was a very rough time for me. I was in a very abusive relationship. But you know, when you don't really like yourself that much, it's really easy to find yourself in those abusive situations constantly. And I said, enough is enough. I'm going back to Fremont. And I started going back to church and I started talking with who my now husband is. And at that point, it almost just became dutiful to me. I was like, well, everybody said this is what's gonna happen. And it's not that I didn't like him. It's not that I didn't find him attractive. Those things were absolutely true, but it was just, we were being pushed together. And I was like, well, I guess this is what we're gonna do then. So we did. And, um, you know, we got married as a straight man and a straight woman. I'm not straight. <laughs> Look at me. <laughs> um, and you know, I knew that I wasn't, and I tried to come out at about 17, 18 years old as bisexual. I identify as pansexual now, it doesn't really matter, you can just call me gay, I don't care. Um, but uh, I tried to come out about 17, 18 years old, and it wasn't taken seriously. You're just doing this for attention, you're with a man, that, that's not true, you just think you are, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, okay, but like my, my history of the things that you don't know that I do behind closed doors says something totally different, I don't know what to tell you, so we just, Put that up on a shelf. We're not going to worry about that. I'm married to a man now, so it doesn't matter, right? It absolutely mattered because I felt like I was squashing this part of myself. So I decided to come out to him and be like, hey, babe, I'm bisexual. And he responded in the chillest way possible. He was like, okay. Yeah, just, just okay. Yeah, you're fine with that? Yeah, why wouldn't I be? I mean, you're not going to leave me for a man. Why would I think you're going to leave me for a woman? It doesn't matter. I don't care. I was like, cool, sweet. And so I felt a lot better. Um, amidst there, we had uh, began to deconstruct our faith. What started our deconstruction was we were pastors. We became youth pastors. And in becoming youth pastors, we were encouraged to go to seminary. So we began going to online seminary. We were only in our, what they call survey classes. And the survey classes is where you break down parts of the Bible, even the parts that aren't published today. You do it in three, four different languages, and you're really going through and you're digging through the history and the, you know, the, the language and the culture of the time. And that's when things started for us, because we were like, the math ain't mathin'. <laughs> the things that they told us kind of sounds like maybe they were telling us that to control us. And not because it's necessarily true. <laughs> It's almost like they were telling us this to just support like the misogynistic narrative and the homophobic narrative that the church likes to push, even though there were, you know, I don't know, at least four gay affairs happening in that church at any given point. The church is, okay, here, hold on, I'm gonna deviate for a second because I told y'all I used to be a pastor, so now you got me going. The church is, in my experience, in my experience, this is just me, 100% of the homophobic churches that I've been in are full of gay affairs. So there's that. Um, that being said, so yes, we deconstructed our faith. We moved away from that. We moved away from the church. We moved an hour away. We're in Michigan now. And, um, you know, I'm starting to you know, find my own friends and find my own way. I was told who I was supposed to be for so long, and so was he, that it was almost like this rebirth. And, you know, we went through a bit of an adolescence, if I'm being very um, honest. But I don't regret that. Our childhood, our childhoods were essentially stolen from us. And we progressed a little bit, but we had a lot of fun. And in doing that, I started hanging out with people who I was more comfortable with. And I met who is my best friend. We met because they got married. Um, my husband and I used to be wedding photographers. And they got married. They were the first same-sex couple that we had ever photographed. 
and um, we became friends afterwards. And we would hang out and go to dinner, and um, one of the people, one of the spouses, took me aside, took me outside, and was like, hey, so you wrote about me this way in your blog, and you refer to me this way, that's not actually who I am, my pronouns are they, them. And I said, what? <laughs> what? What's that mean? And they were like, well, I'm not a woman. And I was like, oh, cool, so you're a trans guy. And they're like, mm -mm, no, 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 nope, that's not it. I'm non-binary. And I was like, I don't understand what that means. Can you explain that a little bit more? And they gave me a very small definition because it's my job to do the research. It's my job to advocate. You know, it's my job to educate myself. It's no, it's no marginalized individual's job to try to educate everybody on their own experience. So I went home and I fell down a Google hole. And I think I was in it for about three hours because I was like, shoot. <laughs> This is me, <laughs> oh my gosh. There's language, there's other people who feel the way that I do, not exactly how I feel, but that's the thing about it is nobody feels exactly how I feel. All of our experiences of gender are completely unique and completely different and I fell down this hole and I kept it to myself for the longest time and I realized I'm, I'm trans. I'm trans and all those memories from my childhood just came flooding back and you know, doing drag was honestly a really big conduit for that as well. The same friend, we went to Toledo Pride one year and as the floats are going by and we see drag queens on the floats, I'm like, hey, you know, that's so cool. And I went to my friend, I'm like, man, I wish there was such a thing as a drag king. I would totally do that. And they were like, dummy, there are tons of drag kings. I said, I'm sorry, what? So they took me, they, they said, hold on, I'm gonna find a show for you. The next week they took me to my first king show and that's where I met Santana Romero, and I said, hi, hello, I love you, please adopt me. And he did, and I'm sure he regrets that decision every day of his life. And then I started doing drag, and I was like, oh my god, I feel so attractive like this. When I would contour my face, and like draw in the facial hair. And then what really got me was when I learned about open chest binding. I don't know if anybody is very familiar with that. It's a type of binding that you do with tape, so that way you can still have an open chest and there's nothing visible. And when I discovered that, my mind was blown, and it was amazing. Pride season can be rough on drag entertainers, right? We lose out on sleep, and sometimes we make decisions that aren't necessarily the healthiest for our bodies, like, maybe I'll just stay in this compression garment a little longer. Maybe I'll just sleep in my makeup. So I decided to just sleep in my tape. Mm -hmm. It's going exactly where you think it's going. I blistered so badly that I couldn't tape again for a few months. And that's fine. I had a binder. I could make do. And I remember getting ready for a show. And I was in the dressing room. This was not in the privacy of my own home. I had this embarrassing moment in front of everybody. And I'm looking in the mirror and I'm taping myself. And I look up and I just, and I start to sob. Because that's an image of myself that I hadn't seen in months. And that was when I was like, all right. We gotta, it's time to make some changes. And I had to come out to my husband. And that was really nerve wracking for me. You know, I belong to a lot of trans and non-binary groups on Facebook and one of the most common stories that you hear from non-binary individuals who were in cis presenting or het presenting marriages who were assigned female at birth is they lose their marriages. And that's nobody's fault. People are attracted to who they're attracted to. If, if my husband entered into a relationship only being attracted to women, and I'm not a woman, that's not his fault. And I put off that conversation as long as I possibly could, and then I finally did it. And you know, you know how it is when you start to kind of put distance between yourself and someone because this is uncomfortable. This is, you know, there's something, there's something here that I don't want to talk about, so we're just gonna, and he felt the distance, he felt it. And I told him, and he, this, he did not, he wasn't perfect. There are mistakes that were made. And there are definitely some questions that he asked that very much centered himself in my experience. But for the most part, he was quiet. And that's the scariest thing to me. No, no, you have to tell me what you're thinking because if I'm left alone with my own thoughts, I can make up anything I want. My imagination is very scary, so you're gonna have to tell me how you're feeling. And he couldn't, he had to wait. And I had to respect that. 
And you know, he came back, you know, essentially uh, maybe a couple days or maybe a week or so later, and he was like, okay, I want to have a very serious conversation with you. And I'm like, oh, here it goes. Life is changing. Better start looking at apartments. And he said, you know, this, this happened, and you, you came out to me, and, and I, I know that I didn't necessarily handle it the best way. I was just really concerned about myself, but it's because I've been concerned about myself because I think I'm gay. So that worked out. <laughs> And we're still together. We don't, it does not even matter. It's, it's almost a trap to try to go back to, well, if we hadn't gone to church and if we weren't in an abused situation, we never would have got to, you know what, screw that. I'm glad that we were able to be there for each other through that situation. And we have such a unique experience growing and learning and exploring our queer identities together. And it has been one of the greatest joys of my life, if I'm being honest. Unfortunately, my family of origin did not have the same response, and we no longer speak. That was my choice. I do want to make that very clear. If they had it their way, they would still be in my life, but they would be in my life in a very disrespectful way. And I made a decision a long time ago that if somebody is going to be in my life, if I'm going to hold space for that, for that person, they're going to enter that space respectfully. And my family's not at a place where they can do that. Maybe they will be one day. I, as things stand now, I doubt it, but that door is never closed. The door to my heart is a revolving one. Once you can offer basic human respect, you're welcome back. Trans Day of Visibility is obviously a very important day for all of us, but it has become a bit of a landmark for me personally. On Trans Day of Visibility in 2020, I attended a virtual hearing to legally change my name. Thank you. On Trans Day of Visibility 2021, I had just recently, within days, made the decision to do Fremont Pride for the first time. On Trans Day of Visibility 2022, that was my first TDOR post-top surgery. That was the first TDOR that I had in a body where I was comfortable. And today, on Trans Day of Visibility in Yellow Springs, I can stand before you and say that tomorrow will be my third time self-administering testosterone. <laughs> Which I never thought I would do. Gender really is a journey. That was something that I never thought was for me, but um, here we are. And even so with how important it is, and even so with how incredibly important this day has become to me personally and my journey personally, it can still be really hard when so often I do actually wish that sometimes I were invisible. When I'm at work and a client comes in and I'm dressed like this, I mean, come on, y'all, I look so handsome. Don't even play with me. Like, I look so good, and he comes in, thanks, ma'am. I just want to be invisible. When I get double takes in the bathroom, it doesn't matter which bathroom I pick. Generally speaking, the men's bathroom is a little safer, but that's because I don't know why y'all do this. You guys are so afraid of looking everybody in the eye. I go in and everybody's walking around like this. Are you looking at all the spots on the floor? I've only been peeing standing up for two years and I'm already better at it than you guys. <laughs> But no matter which bathroom, it's a risk. So, you know, uh, and it makes me want to be invisible. Like, I just have to pee, y'all. It shouldn't be this hard. When I get those stares from strangers, where it's like, and they're looking you up and down because they can't quite decipher what you are and what the actual question in the back of their minds is, I wonder what's inside of that person's underwear. I want to be invisible. When people part the way like the Red Sea because they don't want to get too close to me, I want to be invisible. Even when my friends and the allies in my life consistently still make mistakes and they give me the, well, I'm trying, that makes me want to be invisible too because while I appreciate the effort, it's not my responsibility to comfort you when you mess up because it makes me feel bad. When I'm the only person in the room 
that somebody says, what are your pronouns? Because I'm the only one that looks trans. I want to be invisible. With this current legislation targeting our community and the fact that I have children and one of my children is non-binary, you better believe I wish I could disappear so I could protect those babies. With the grooming accusations that our community gets, you guys are only doing this so that we can groom kids. You're trying to make more kids trans. No, we're trying to make sure trans kids survive so they can grow up to be trans adults. Only 1.8% of children in the United States even identify as being trans. There aren't more of them. We're not grooming them. If anything, the opposite is true. There's a cis head grooming that takes place. You get a little boy a onesie that says heartbreaker, lady killer, stud muffin. Are you kidding me? They're six months old. You don't know who they are. That might not even be a boy, but we're the ones with the agenda. It's heartbreaking and it's hard. And people treat the transgender experience like it's new, but we've always been here. We can be found in ancient Greece, in Mesopotamia, a Roman empress, a Union Civil War soldier, and in indigenous peoples all across the globe. And we have consistently tried to be erased. Colonialism tried really hard to erase the trans experience, which is fueled by white supremacy. White supremacy and queer phobia, y'all, it's two sides of the same coin. They literally burned our history. That's why you can't find a lot of us in your history books. It was destroyed. Our existence has literally tried to be eradicated from the history books. Nazi Germany, their first target was trans and disabled people because people know that if you can find one common enemy that you can get everybody to target, eventually you'll be able to target that out and you know, maybe like Jewish people like myself or in our country, you know, let's target the trans people and then it'll be easier to target the black people and then it'll be easier to target the women. The Republican platform today is trying to wipe us out, which if you do some reading, it's pretty identical to the Nazi party platform about a year and a half before Dashun opened. But we're still here. My generation and the one before me, we survived unlike so many before us. We survived the AIDS epidemic. We survived the queer phobia. We were the ones who were stubborn enough to say, no, I'm not gonna let that hurt me today. And that's not to say that there's strength, that, that some people possess more strength than others because violence against the trans community is included in self-harm, 100%. You know, transphobic rhetoric causes self-harm within individuals, especially within our trans teens. God, every time you misgender or show lack of support to a trans teen, you heard the statistic that Alyssa rattled off. That automatically goes up by 60%. That's terrifying. And people want to talk about protecting our kids? What about protecting our trans kids, y'all? But we survived, right? And anthropologists are learning and applying new knowledge to old findings to add our history back into the history that they tried to erase. We're getting representation now in the media. My kids were watching Disney Plus. I don't know what show they were watching. A few weeks or months ago, I don't know, I have ADHD, I have a spicy sense of time. And they paused the video and started yelling. And they're like, Rennie, come in here, come here. They call me Rennie, Ren, Rennie for like the Aryan and parent. They picked it out. They're really cute. Um, they're like, come in here, you gotta come in here. And I was like, oh my God, what's wrong? And so I go into the room, they're like, watch. And they rewind and they press play. It was a, maybe y'all can help me. I don't know what cartoon this was, but there was a girl in like the, the uh, you know, the feminine products aisle uh, trying to decide like, what do I need? Because she started her first period and all these people started coming into the aisle and there was this mom that said, oh honey, you know, here, maybe you can try this, this is great. And then this other kid comes in and like, actually, I don't like that one. I like this one because it fits me better. And then this boy comes in with a t-shirt that has a blue, pink, white, pink, and blue stripe. And he pops in and says, I like these. That's all they wanted to show me, but that stuck with them. That visibility stuck with them. 
And that's why it's important. And even our connection through TikTok, which we're trying to get silence there too, but it's this free and open communication and social media platform that doesn't necessarily uh, get paid through click funnels and through advertisements like you know TikTok or uh, Instagram and Facebook does. And it's this free and open forum where people have come together and realized, oh my gosh, we have so many shared experiences. And this is why visibility is so important. Our transestors fought and survived and died so that way I could walk. And I walk so that way the next generation can run. It looks like we're pushing things on the general population, but it looks that way because they destroyed our history and because we were the ones who survived. We're not trying to push an agenda on anyone. We are simply trying to display that we exist and we exist everywhere. We want to come up in your media so that way you can have a conversation with your children so that way when they come up you know, in front of us in the actual world, they are prepared for that. Or what if, God forbid, one of your kids actually ends up being trans and they find themselves in these silly cartoons or the, that, that, what was that cartoon that was about a witch and she was a lesbian? Uh, I don't remember, but it was on, is it on Hulu, Disney Plus? I don't know. It's wild. I'm so excited about it. <laughs> We're simply trying to display that we exist. And honestly, had I had these resources and this representation as a kid, it would have completely changed my life. Completely changed my life. I wouldn't have gone through that whole period of just repression where I was, I was miserable. I was absolutely miserable. Maybe I wouldn't have taken that little grippy sock vacation that I took when I was 20 years old. My life would have changed for the better because I would have seen myself in life. Do you know how many times I've been on TikTok and I have seen young trans people put like crying emojis on elder trans people's videos? Like, I didn't think we got old. I didn't think we grew up. If seeing our existence, if simply seeing that we exist is viewed as resistance, then our joy is protest. We were the ones who, be oh, just, oh, all right, there we go, sorry. We were the ones who, when our parents and our teachers and our elders told us, you can be anything you want to be. We believed that. We were the ones who had the audacity to actually take them for face value when they said to us, it's not on the outside, it's what's on the inside that counts. We picked up that mantle and we ran so fast into love and truth and light. And when you exist in that amount of joy and that amount of peace and that knowledge and that truth in who you are, it looks so scary to people who are not able to cross over into that. And I'm not saying that to imply that transphobia comes from repressed transness. I'm simply saying that freedom looks scary to people who don't experience it. And you don't have to be trans to experience that. But it takes a lot of self-reflection and a lot of time alone with yourself to get to where you are right now. When you are born in this cisgender heteronormative box, you have to fight and claw your way out of it. And that brings about a self-awareness that scares some people. If it's safe for you to do so, trans people, I would love if you would protest with me by showcasing your joy. And allies, protest for me by amplifying trans joy, because trans kids deserve to grow up to be trans adults. Thank you. If I could leave you with just one last thing, allies in the room. To be an ally is to be an ally all the time, and not just when the trans person is around. It is stepping in and correcting 
A dead name or a misgender? Yes, every time. Will you get annoying? Yes, that's the point. We thank you for it. It is saying something when you hear an off-color joke. Yeah, every time. Because it sneaks in, it's sneaky. It sneaks into those jokes. And those jokes normalize things. And it normalizes being grossed out by transness. And it normalizes trans panic and violence against us. Speak up against it. And ultimately, trust us that we are the experts in our own experience. Please don't ever get complacent. You all live in a lovely, amazing community. But please don't ever get to a spot where you're like, we are great, we're good. We are always learning. I'm always learning about myself and I will always do my best to help you learn along with me. But if I could just leave you with that, trust we are the experts in our own experience. Maintain an open mind, never ever stop learning. And trans people, stay. Stay, because our history doesn't need to get erased again. Thank you. And Stevie, we're so glad that you made the decision to remain visible. D. Rockwood lives near Yellow Springs and can be found Tuesday evenings and Friday mornings at the Yellow Springs Senior Center teaching Tai Chi for balance and wellness and at Antioch College Wellness Center volunteering in the gym and health club. D. is a grandmaster at multiple karate schools after having her own successful career, including winning medals at the Trans Am Games and the Olympics. D. also enjoys biking, scuba diving, and motorcycling skiing and socializing as well. <laughs> she enjoys writing, um, writing action, adventure, and fiction novels, including Stolen Lives, available through Amazon. Her newest book, Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness, which will be released soon, Transgender Publishing. <laughs> the riveting story of transgender women's journey of self-discovery. Please welcome Dee Rockwood. Just say ditto and sit down. <laughs> that was as amazing a talk as I've ever been a part of, heard, or seen. All you gotta do is change a noun or two, a moment or two, and her, his story is my story. The religion, the isolation, the struggles, all of them, so very, very similar. And I won't. So I'm not going to go through my usual copy of that. I want to tell you a couple of other things, some history. Because I am that generation that survived that he mentioned. I was the one. First one in Butler County. First one in Ohio. Lafayette, uh, Lawrence County, Ohio. You gotta say it like that, by the way. If you're in Lawrence County, Ohio, and you say it that way, they say, where? Because <laughs> those hillbillies have a whole different idea of the English language. <laughs> it's interesting, I didn't grow up next door to somebody. In 1953, I discovered that I was different. And I had no idea why I was different. But my dad sure as hell pointed it out to me in the most strictest of terms. And at three years old, you don't think of good or bad, boy or girl. It's just people. And somehow I was a bad person at three years old. And then I was told about this marvelous place that's called kindergarten. And that's where I was going to get to learn stuff. And I was going to meet new people. And I was going to have friends. And it turned out so much. You go to school and you find out new words. Words like sissy. And you go, wait, what? How does, where does the hostility come from? Why does that happen? Who told us, them, that I was wrong? And then you travel along thinking that you're the only one. And trust me, in 1955, I was. 
It wasn't until 1960s that I read a book from Christine Jorgensen that coined the phrase, a word, a magic word, it said transsexual. And go, oh shit, that's what I am. That's who I am. And then a little bit later, really, Ray Dane Richards convinced me that there was actually other people just like me looking for the same solutions. Now we're going to jump forward. Uh, it was interesting. Stevie uh, was 36. I came out at 37. I'm that generation that he mentioned that survived. I'm 73 years old. And the first time I did one of these talks, it was in Northern Kentucky University for a Dr. Bishop. And he ran across me at a, uh, uh, <laughs> in a doctor's office that, uh, while well, I was getting therapy, trying to get fixed. Because I was broken. I was convinced I was broken. And Dr. Bishop comes to me and he says, well, would you talk to my class? Would you tell them your experience? I go, uh, okay. And I went there and I told him, told that class, now, as I stand here, not one of those per persons would admit to even knowing a gay person. Never even heard of transgender. Had no idea what transsexual was. And I stood there all by my lonesome in a room much bigger. Now I'm in a little room, and I see brothers, and I see sisters, and I see all, all of the other in-betweens, and my heart is lifted. Dr. Peterson and I have spent the last 33 years, 33 years, educating the local area, Wright State, University of uh, uh, Dayton, University of Cincinnati, we stood in front of hundreds of people, and that hundreds translates into thousands. So this survival that Stevie spoke of, and that I managed to somehow make, didn't come by itself. It came by a lot of pain, a lot of strain, a lot of struggle. So I was very fortunate that my parents, in trying to fix me, put me in the martial arts. So at eight years old, two things, <laughs> two things happened. One, I started learning a, a, a physical skill that gave my energy and my focus, self-discipline, and they also gave me a trophy for beating up boys. <laughs> Damn! <laughs> well, how the heck did that come? And at 12 years old, I had a black belt and kick of uh, judo. 12, 14, I was a black belt in karate, then jujitsu, and then aikido, and then I ran into a Buddhist who changed my life. The way I thought about how people were supposed to treat people. Stevie was talking about being a, uh, a minister. Turns out I went through seminary. I was the youngest couple in Presbyterian Youth Fellowship minister in 1969. I just got, and the best story I've got for that, because I've got two of them, one of them is, is that uh, I got back from Woodstock, confused. <laughs> Why is that funny? <laughs> I don't know it's funny. So I, I get back. And my minister was asked to uh, have a interracial marriage. And it had only become legal in 1967, only two years. And my reverend at the time, Reverend Holman, he said, well, yeah, I would love to marry you and your new, uh, your fiance. He said, I had to take that to the board. Took it to the board, and the board said, not our church, you go. And he's, he was amazed, but he came to me as a newly ordained minister and said, I'm going to give you a hint. My name was Wright. Long before Stallone and long before 
Dwayne, trust me. <laughs> they weren't even born yet. Yeah, anywho, he said, Rock, will you marry this couple? And I said, oh yeah, I'll do that for you. Because I work for him and not the church. The following week, they excommunicated me and damn near fired him. Now, that story is only relevant because in 2015, I got to do another marriage, same sex. So we survived. Somehow we got from point A to point B. And along those troubled journeys, the support that I got from sort of the psychological community was minimal. They tried to fix me. The support I got from churches was not nil. They tried to fix me. And now I spend my life trying to help you become who you are. Now I'm going to stop now because Stephen, like I said, I could have said ditto and sit down. <laughs> the story would be the same. But I want to say two things about Yellow Springs, about the leaders in this community. I came to the very first Pride Parade. There was 12 people. <laughs> and there was two cars, and the policeman and the fire truck. And that was our parade here. It's grown, it's a sport, it's amazing. So thank you Yellow Springs for giving these young people the safe place that you have. Thank you for that moment, this day of visibility. I am so grateful. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> um, I just want to say a quick thank you to Yellow Springs Community Access, Lacey Fox, Station Manager, she's here. And when we talk about visibility, we have people that are supporting us, and this is going out to the community as well. So it's not just in this room. What's happening here is not just here. So I want to say a special thank you to Lacey. So we have a special treat right now. Today our official photographer is Lee Wade. He also has a podcast, and the name of the podcast is Black Trans Men Talk. Black Trans Men Talk is a pod podcast that gives black trans men a platform to discuss things like gender, sexuality, masculinity, and physical, mental, and emotional health. The podcast started out as a class project um, that was supposed to be only one episode, but Wade, Lee Wade, decided to continue with it after seeing the impact that it had on those who it was shared with. Episode one, which we will see right now, is a conversation with his father sharing his perspective um, of being a black trans man shortly after he was released from a three-year prison sentence. This is an audio podcast, the first episode, and we are going to hear it right now. Thank you for tuning in to Black Trans Men Talk, a black trans men podcast taking a closer look at gender, masculinity, health, fitness, and LGBTQ plus topics that are taking place around the world today. I'm your host, Lee Wade, a music producer, content creator, college student, and black trans man. On today's episode, I'm going to be talking with musician, father, and family man, Danny Wade. Oh, and I can't forget, he's also my dad. I interviewed my dad to get his perspective on me, his son being a black trans man. We talk about life and many other things. Check this out. So you just came back home two or three weeks ago? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah from yeah. doing uh, three years. Before you went in, like I had came out to you when I was 15 years old. Remember that? Mm -hmm. I think we was at home, mm -hmm. and it was like October 2016 or something. I had, was was having a conversation with you, and I was like, Dad, like I'm trans, and he was like, I already knew that. <laughs> yeah. So before you went to prison, like you already knew that I was trans, but I wasn't transitioning yet. Mm -hmm. I was out socially, like I came out to family, stuff like that, but I didn't start medically transitioning in, until that same month that you went to prison. I had changed a lot 
before you came back home and you see me. Mm-hmm. So like the first day that I came and when you when you first see me, what was your reaction? Like this this the same way that I know or you know, did you was you like, uh man, like, you know, Lee look Lee look different. Uh uh when I saw you, you know, I mean, you know, I already knew that, you know, you had that in you was doing had that in mind, you was doing that, you know, changing you over I already you know, you, you know, it was just like to me, the same person, you know what I mean? But you, you, you know, yeah, you changed, got the mustache and beard, you know, <laughs> it looked good on you, know. <laughs> Heck yeah, but yeah, 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 I already know that you had that in you. That's what you, was, you don't want to do it, and 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 and, and, and yeah, it looked good on you. You know what I'm saying? I did. When, when, when I saw you, I was, you know, I wasn't. I wasn't surprised because, I, I, you know, I know you was doing things to, to change over, you know. Mm-hmm. Even even your voice got a little bit of uh, bass in it. You kind of tripped me out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, that's cool. That's cool, though, you know. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you, 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 you know, I still look at you as my baby. So, you know, mm-hmm. you know, you know, you see you're the same person to me, you know me. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's you know it's, it's it's cool you know. Yeah, I, I, I like it you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I appreciate that, Dad. Yeah, like at first, like I didn't think that you would be that supportive, but you know, like like I would beat around the bush or you know, mm-hmm. not not really talk about because I didn't know how like supportive you'll be. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, you like it? I love it. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It's everything cool with me, you know. Yeah. 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 Put it down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Talk a little bit about, like, you know, what what makes you so supportive? Uh, I always looked at it like, you know, what makes you happy makes makes me happy, you know. If that's what you like to, do, you know, be, you know, want to be, you know, or, or, or the way you feel, you know, I'm 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 down with you, you know. As long as you happy, I'm happy, you know. That's the way I look at it, you know. I don't see nothing wrong with it myself, you know what I'm saying? You even look good with it, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, yeah. You see how you smile, shit. It, it makes me smile, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I see the mustache and everything, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. It's slick on you, you know what I'm saying? The little beard, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's cool, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ain't nothing wrong with it. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Dad. <laughs> not that many people, like, in our family is, like, or, like, especially older people, they're not supportive of, like, being trans, let alone gay or, like, mm-hmm. lesbian. So, yeah, I do appreciate you for, you know, being supportive. Because mm-hmm. not only, like, you being um, my father, but you was, like, like, my mom and my dad. So mm-hmm. the way that you thought and you're, like, um... Your opinion about what I do and stuff like that really mattered to me. So I just wanted to um, be sure that, you know, you was okay with my decisions that I make in life. Not other people who are trans have supportive parents. Like, what would be your advice to them? What would you say to them if they're, like, not supportive? Well, I I, I would say to them, you know, if they uh, weren't supportive, you know, they ought to sit down and talk to the big child and they ought to realize, you know, uh, if that made them make them happy, they should be supportive uh, to them, you know what I'm saying, because it, 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 it'll help them grow and, 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 and have a positive mind and, and, and to, do, to do things right instead of being uh, uh, going out there and, and feel like they all alone and they leave them and then they don't have no conversation with their, to their, with their child and stuff, you know what I mean? I think this going it, 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 it's that's something that'll uh, break the child's heart. Yeah, I appreciate you having this conversation with me, Dad. I think for a long time I was putting it on the back burner because I didn't, you know, I didn't know what your what your point of view of it was going to be. But now I see that you're supportive and you even got good advice for you know other parents. So yeah, and yeah. I love you. Love you, you know. too. Yeah. <laughs> there you have it. My dad expresses that whatever makes me smile, makes him smile. I think those are the most supportive words that you can hear from a parent. I'm your host, Lee Wade, and thank you for listening to Black Trans Men Talk. What an honest conversation, right? What an honest conversation. 
Our next presenters uh, need no introduction, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Artist, writer, and poet, Aiden Crockett creates intensely personal pieces of art. Her words and her pictures tell a story of her journey through PTSD, depression, and the discovery of her identity as a transgender woman. She is the author of Black, White, and Red All Over, an illustrated volume of poetry available on Amazon.com, as well as the monthly column, My Name is Iden, and the blog, Ask a Trans Person, both for the Yellow Springs News. She lives in Yellow Springs with her wife and three children. Follow her work here, www.mynameisiden.com. Please welcome Iden Crockett. Is this the right distance from my mouth? Okay, wonderful. Wow, well, everybody. My name is Aiden, and I was thinking how much I don't like to be later in the program, how I prefer to speak first, because I'm always worried that what I've thought about to say, someone else is going to get up here and say first, and then I'm going to really have to improvise. Um, but there is something great about going later in the program because now there are a lot of things that I don't have to say because Stevie and Dee and Alyssa have come out here and, and said them for me, so that's, that's a relief. I don't have to come up here and expand on why visibility is important, why it's necessary. I don't have to go over all of the challenges that the community faces. Instead, I can do what I really wanted to do, which is talk about the powerfully positive experience that being out and visible and transitioning has been for me. Because I consider being transgender to be a great, great blessing to me. The reason I say that is because I have learned how to become an active participant in my life. And I'm going to spend the next couple minutes maybe telling you what the hell I mean by that. Because I think it's important, and I think it's not just for transgender, non-binary people. So, I'm going to tell a little bit of my story, which I don't normally do, but it was different from the other stories I heard up here. I heard three years old, I heard four years old. I didn't realize I was transgender until I was 42 years old. The day I realized I was transgender was the day I began transition, and the day I came out. Up until then, all I knew was that I was really, really sad, really depressed, very lonely, very empty feeling. I had no idea why. And I was trying so hard to figure out why, to fix myself. I thought maybe if I could just be a more ripped dude, I would like how the mirror treated me. And so I would, man, push-ups, chin-ups, gym, all the supplements, and I was absolutely shredded. Everybody loved it, except for me. I hated it, and I felt terrible. I thought, oh, maybe if I just knocked off a few of my bucket list items, maybe if I opened a record store, maybe if I could work in my career, all these things, and I did all of those things, and all I did was spend all of my money and wear myself out, and I was still sad. And then one day, I figured it out. The day I was standing in front of the mirror, first presenting a female, the first day I met Aiden, I realized what was, what was wrong. And what was wrong wasn't presenting as the wrong gender. What was wrong wasn't dysphoria. What was wrong was that I'd been trying to find myself and define myself using other people's values using other people's expectations. All of us, as soon as, as soon as we hit the air as a newborn, people start pasting over our true selves with their hopes and their expectations, their morals, and they do it so thoroughly that by the time you're expected to make choices for yourself, you can't even see yourself. You've been completely plastered over with other people's thoughts and fears and baggage. By being trans is a blessing. It's because it forced me into a corner, forced me in front of the mirror. And the risk of dating myself, I would like to reference now my, one of my very favorite movies and my favorite scene from it. And take it back to 1998 
when I was in the theater with my roommates from college watching The Matrix, <laughs> and Neo is in the mansion, and the fire is burning, and Morpheus is sitting across from him with his amazing sunglasses. <laughs> and she offers him the blue pill or the red pill. Now, I don't think it's any coincidence that that scene reads the way it does, if you know about the Wachowskis, and it's no coincidence that it's stuck with me for so long. But as I was standing in front of the mirror, and Aiden is there, and she has her hand out to me, I understood what it was to be Neo in that moment. Because, and I had a choice. I could walk away, pretend that I'd never met her, pretend that I hadn't glimpsed any of the truth, and try to go back to the world that was given to me. And it was real time. <laughs> or, I could follow her through the looking glass, right? Take the red pill, do all of those metaphors, and, and see what happened. And I didn't know what would happen. All I knew was that what I thought was true about myself was not. Who I thought I was wasn't true. What I thought I wanted wasn't true. What else wasn't true? How could I, how could I go back? I couldn't. And so I took her hand and I stepped through there and God, God knows what's happened to me since. <laughs> And that, that was just the first step of this journey. Transition, to me, has nothing to do with your gender. It has to do with peeling off every one of those stickers, scraping off that paint, all of that nonsense that other people gave to you and that you thought were yours, did not. Transition has helped me to look at every single part of my life. And now I pick the clothes I want to wear. I hang out with the friends I want to hang out with. I chose the name I wanted to be called with. I found the voice I wanted to use. And it's incredibly powerful to 42 years old finally make a decision that was my own. And that decision was to walk through the mirror, to follow her, to take the red pill. And, and that was the first step. The reason I want to share that story, offer it to you here, because I think a lot of the trans people here know this, right? They've been there. You can't escape it if you're trans, and that's why it's a gift. But if you're not trans, maybe you don't know. Maybe you don't think about those things. You've never been forced into that corner because it's so easy for you to go out and, and nobody picks on you, and, and the inside of your head isn't exploding with terrible thoughts. But that freedom exists for everybody here. None of us are allowed to be ourselves. But the, the, the opportunity is there. So for any of my trans friends who are still sort of looking in the mirror and deciding which pill to swallow, let me tell you, the red one is it's spicy, right? It's not easy, but it's incredible. And my cis friends, please realize that someone is offering you two choices as well. And, and you can choose to be active in your own life. You can choose to be yourself. And you don't have to be ashamed. You don't have to be afraid. That's what I wanted to share with you guys today. And since everybody went a little bit longer than I thought, and I have some more time maybe, I was wondering if my lovely boy John would hand me my phone because I have a poem in here that I wrote, and I don't normally write poems that sort of end positively. But I thought maybe I would, because this is like a super trans poem, and I like it, and Philip said I was a poet, and now I feel pressure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so just bear with me here for a second, because I write so many of these, and most of them are garbage. But this poem, when I find it, here it is. It's called An Ode to My Boob Sweat. <laughs> I used to, and I've never read this, I've never read this out loud before, so we'll see how it goes. I used to hate sweat, being sweaty. I never understood this as Reebok, Gatorade, Under Armour, the man at the sidelines, the high fives of bros with masculinity streaming off his face, turning neon blue as he replenishes his electrolytes. 
or pounding his way, sunbaked and panting to the top of the mountain, hands on his head, staring out with satisfaction at the desert canyon, perspiration washing away all of life's disappointments and false promises. They all just seemed gross and sticky, stained and exhausted, but that didn't keep me out of the gym, not even for a second. No amount of discomfort or disgust would help. In fact, it was that very emotional parry that drove me there daily for decades. I stood sweating at the intersection of aforementioned alliterative avenues. Shapes became acceptable as meals. Days divided and labeled by limb, chest day, back day, leg day, bench, squat, leg up, jaw, crunch, sweat, stink, rinse, repeat. That was my strategy for transformation. And I believed with enough discipline and enough practice that I could sweat out my masculinity, that I could perspire away my lifetime of disappointment, that I could create a body that was mine and self that I loved. I worked until I was soaking every rivulet flowing off my shaved head, camouflaging my tears. 20 years in the gym, and I was jacked, shredded, ripped, and I was as far from me as I could get. I was sticky, stained, and exhausted, my clothes clinging tightly to a perfect specimen of wrong-mindedness. Today, I don't rehydrate on the sideline with my bros anymore. I was cut from that team, and I no longer seek peace to conquer. I don't have anything to prove anymore. Today, I walk at a modest pace, and a modest amount of sweat gathers the crease from my t-shirt and nuzzles up underneath my modest little breasts. Afterwards, I stand in front of the mirror, put my hands on my head, and regard the satisfaction in my shirt and its pair of darkened half moons that look to me like smiles. See, a poet. <laughs> Our last presenter is um, going to be viewed on the screen. Um, and we are so excited to have their participation again this year. Um, Shelby Chestnut is movement leader and policy expert um, demonstrated with over 20 years of experience. They are the first native trans executive director at Transgender Law Center, where they started as a director of policy and programs. Prior to TLC, Shelby served as a director of community organizing and public advocacy at the New York City Anti-Violence Project. Throughout their decades of experience, notable success including helping launch projects like the Disability Project, Black Trans Circles, and the Trans Agenda for Liberation, the community-led guide outlining solutions towards a better world for all. Additionally, they've been among coalitions advancing the Violence Against Women Act and the NYC Right to Know Act, increasing resources for LGBTQ survivors of domestic violence and creating rapid response models for anti-LGBTQ violence. Shelby is a graduate of Antioch College and the New School no, go ahead and clap. We home now. We home now. <laughs> Shelby is a graduate of Antioch College and the New School and currently the chair of the Board of Trustees at Antioch College. Shelby Chestnut. Hi, everyone. It's Shelby here. Um, I think some of you know me, some of you might not know me. So my name is Shelby Chestnut. I'm a graduate of Antioch College, class of 2005. Um, community manager 2005 to 2006, and I'm currently on the board of trustees as the chair of the board. And in my day job, I work as the executive director of the Transgender Law Center. So we're the largest trans led organization in the world. I'm sorry I can't be there in person to have this conversation with you. I'm currently in upstate New York visiting my good friend from Antioch and their little family. So um, you know, I'm thinking a lot about um, as we approach Trans Day of Visibility and what it means in this moment when our communities are under some of the greatest attacks they've ever seen. Um, what does it mean to be trans invisible? Um, and I guess for me, um, something that I'm trying to really remember in this moment is that a lot of people don't understand transgender people, but they're not opposed to transgender people. So I think a lot of times folks are scared to ask questions or do learning and they don't want to offend someone. 
Um, but I think when we kind of stay in the shadows and don't talk about how we need to center trans people in all of our work, whether that's in higher education, whether that's in the village of Yellow Springs, whether that's in affordable housing, whether that's in city governments, um, whether that's, you know, everywhere. Um, we're making it so people might not feel safe to be who they are and to name who they are. Um, I was super fortunate to come from a family who was super supportive of me as a young age, both coming out as queer and as trans, and then um, was blessed to attend Antioch College um, and have a lot of queer and trans classmates. And, you know, in this moment, I feel like I'm in a leadership position and also scared um, about what's happening. Um, so every day I get to come to work and be very proud to be transgender and talk about the importance of transgender people. And also there's a really small minority of people who are insistent that trans people are something bad and something that shouldn't be celebrated. And, um, you know, I'll say this, they're not, they're not right. Um, in fact, they're wrong. And I think it's conversations like you all are having and the work that everyone can do if they're transgender or not, to think about um, how do we create environments where transgender people are not only celebrated, but looked to as people that we can learn from and alongside. Um, and I think, you know, particularly young people today, like their ideas of gender and sexuality are so much more expansive than even my generation. Um, I was born in the eighties. Um, so yeah, I just think a lot about um, people that inspire me and people that are willing to sort of do the work and do the change. And I think it's amazing that um, events like this are happening in Yellow Springs on Antioch College's campus and what that means to sort of elevate this moment. You know, and I also think we have to talk about the ways that our work and our identities are intersectional. You know, trans justice is not, um, going to happen if it's not inclusive of racial justice and housing justice and economic justice and also just really the intersections of that work um and I think right now for me as a as a as an adult working with a lot of young people I also think it's my obligation to sort of stand alongside transgender youth and lift up the amazing work that they're doing around this country um and I know that the news right now is really scary but I also think it's a moment where we need to start telling our stories and celebrating our victories um, and moving things forward. Um, because I've known for a long time and I hope you all can learn to realize that laws and policies are just one aspect of our life, um, but they're not really gonna be the culture and the things that ultimately sort of control our communities that we're part of. It's coming together and talking about sort of how I'm coming to this and it might be different than you and making sure that no one is disposable. Um, so for me, I'm thinking about the visible trans people that were in my life at a young age. Um, you know, I think the first time I saw a transgender person was on television and it was the movie Boys Don't Cry, you know, and that was in the late 1990s. It was about a transgender man in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, who was killed for being transgender. And the character in the movie was played by a cisgender person. And then fast forward, you know, 20, 25 years later, and trans people are not only portraying trans people in television and film, but they are leading the film and television industry and telling those stories and getting them out there. Um, I think, um, especially a place like Yellow Springs, which is sort of this sanctuary for so many um, sort of progressive thinking, um, even even Yellow Springs has work to do to make sure that transgender people are safe and affirmed and welcome, um, especially in a place like Ohio, which, you know, their legislature is attacking so many of our communities, but particularly LGBT communities, communities of color, immigrant communities. Um, so how do we start to have those conversations as sort of broader community around like, hey, I might not know language and terminology, but I'm down to support you and I want to le learn alongside you. Um, so I think that to me is sort of what I'm thinking about on Transgender Day of Visibility. We can talk about the doom and gloom and we can talk about how all the things we don't have, but I want to take a moment to think about all the things that we do have. We have each other. Um, we have young people today who are more sort of understanding and expansive in their ideas of these things and making space for new versions of people 
and cultural sort of understandings to exist. Um, you know, like young people today can access the internet in ways that like I certainly could not as a young person. I remember I used to go take the bus into, I lived, I grew up in Minnesota, I used to take the bus from the suburbs to the city to pick up what was called um, Lavender Magazine to like try and meet other queer and trans people. Um, and now in the age of TikTok and Instagram and Snapchat or Be Real, as some of the Antioch students have taught me about, you can meet other trans people, you can meet other queer people, you know, you can do that learning. There's so many resources on the internet if you are an ally to trans people and you want to learn how to be more supportive. Um, I would encourage you to check out the Transgender Law Center's website if you're interested in that. It's transgenderlawcenter.org and our Instagram is Trans Law Center. So I'm gonna let you all have a special evening and a celebratory evening. And I hope that you just kind of look around the room and one, see each other's humanity, but also see that um, we need to really move past a sort of culture that fears what they don't know. And oftentimes um, transgender people are the scapegoat of a lot of what people don't know. Um, so they're trying to create laws and policies that will not only limit us as people, but also take away our humanity. And I can tell you in the work I do every day that they're not gonna win. Um, our people are resilient, our people are full of joy. And um, right now we need to lean on each other more than ever. I hope you have a great transgender day of visibility. On? Okay, good. Yeah, so um, God, Shelby and I went to Antioch together. It's just Yay. my heart. <laughs> yeah. So we're, we're pretty much wrapping up where we have uh, a close out with Philip, but um, this is the part of the program that's just had a, a <laughs> placeholder for call to action. Um, so I think everybody who spoke had a call to action. Um, the one thing that we had talked about as a planning committee is to make sure that we're not just um, sort of complacent, but that we're very intentional and vocal in embracing and affirming and welcoming transgendered people and transgendered youth into our, the classrooms, into our houses of worship, into our clubs, into our sports, and even here in Yellow Springs, um, making sure that we're being extra intentional about that, because you don't know what's in somebody's heart. So we need to hear it. Um, and I also really uh, just wanna thank everybody for coming out here and make sure you vote. That's my <laughs> other call to action. Um, But I'm just, I'm so grateful to be um, part of the Antioch community and part of the Yellow Springs community and part of the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Emily. And, um, and yes, thank you all so much for sitting Thank you for listening. Thank you for being interested in intentional spaces and intentional time. And one of the takeaways, I hope, we left some time in our schedule for mingling and talking and sharing and connecting because we know that this particular event happens once a year, but we want to change that. But a lot of that change is going to, be, um, it's going to come through the connection of you all. We're here to help facilitate and create ideas. Yellow Springs Pride is committed to that, and we would like to partner with you to see what can we do? What do you want, and how can we make these things happen? How can we have more intentional spaces. I do want to take just a few minutes before I um, wrap it up and, um, and do some special thank yous. I would like to thank um, the entire Transgender Day of Vis Visibility Committee that worked on this wonderful day. I would just like to thank, if you're on the committee, please just stand so everybody can recognize you and the work that you've done here. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. I would also like to thank Mayor Pam, Thank you, Mayor Pam. The Village of uh, Yellow Springs Village Council, President Brian House, thank you so much. Um, Village Community Access, YSCA for Channel 5. And Lacey, thank you for being here today and giving voice to this event. Lee Wade, our official photographer and uh, podcaster. Thank you, Lee. 
our partnering organizations, YS Pride, Inclusive uh, Resilient Yo Springs, and Antioch College, um, specifically this place where we're in this house. Thank you so much, um, Shadia, for opening the doors and always being available. I want to thank our amazing presenters that we had today. If you presented today, if you're still here, I know that um, the people have to go, but if you're here, just stand so we can just recognize you and appreciate you and say we see you today. So this is the close of the formal portion. We are still gonna be here. We have our step and repeat over here. Get some pictures, enjoy yourself, exchange numbers, exchange stories. We do have some snacks that are out there. So if you would like to have some snacks, we have more than enough. So even if you wanna take home some to your kids, if you have kids, you gotta work tomorrow, you just need a snack to keep going, we have some. So thank you so much uh, and, oh, and, Yellow Springs Pride, the festival this year is on Saturday, the last Saturday in June. That is June the 24th. So please join us in celebration. More visibility, more inclusiveness, right? All right, have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Special thanks to Alex for the audio and the visual.